Hello. In this episode of Airs for Architecture, I spoke with Charlotte Skeen Caitling, founding principal of Skeen Caitling de la Pena, about her research led practice, especially the idea of geo archaeology, perhaps most notably embodied, I think, in their prize winning and extraordinary Flint House, Buckinghamshire. Airs for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture, and space. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Airs for Architecture. I'm talking today to Charlotte Skeen Catling of Skeen Catling de la Pena's Architects in London. Uh, Charlotte, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself? Um, hello, it's lovely to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, yes, I'm, I'm an architect um, of the practice Skeen Catling de la Pena and um, I've been practicing, I suppose, for about 20 years, which is hard to believe now because I feel um, somewhat on the the edge or the margins of, of conventional architecture. So it's, 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 it always makes me feel odd when I call myself an architect. It seems still too grown up. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, but it is one of those industries that one matures late into. Um, so, I wanted to speak to you. I've been using one particular piece of your work in my teaching since I came a, I suppose it, it thrust itself into my consciousness um, and uh, into a lot of people's minds, I, I think, which was your Flint House from 2015, 2014, 2015. Mm, yeah. Um, a very beautiful and extraordinary piece of work. Um, and then have obviously since that time followed your other work as well and so I wanted to speak to you for a long time so I'm very grateful um and and I and I think we'll come around to talking about that and to talking about this concept that you describe geoarchaeology which you use as a kind of motivation instrument for developing architecture but perhaps it would be nice I think to hear about your training and where what sort of your background as an architect and your journey to architecture, which I think is an important way of certainly the listenership understanding the diverse route into the, pre- mm. into the profession and what being a professional architect might might look like, might entail. Mm. Um, well, it, it wasn't sort of direct or straightforward. Um, and I think... I mean, growing up, uh, we moved around a lot. My father um, is a writer and um, I think he was sort of restless and got bored. So we we tended to shift a lot. I grew up in Ireland, but also in New York and um, in Long Island in England. And I think it was that sort of sense of, 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 of restlessness, of a sort of peripatetic existence that 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 led to a need for some kind of stability. Do you know there was there was something um, rather unspoken. Um, I mean, Ireland was the place that I always felt most most closely attached to in terms of a landscape. I think I think uh, there are places at a particular age when you're. I mean, we we were sort of feral as as kids. We just spent most of our time, you know, in rock pools or sliding in mud. So it was very much sort of being part of the landscape um, as 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 children. And I think um, I think that's the, what stays with you. And then and then being in New York, which was you know, Ireland was like going back in time a hundred years somehow. It was very primitive then. All they taught in school was was the catechism Gaelic in the Times Table. You know, it was really primitive. And that, then, was, and they, that was bad enough. <laughs> maybe too much. I didn't. Know. <laughs> and and then going from there to New York, you know, in the, in the late seventies, early eighties, going back and forth between these two worlds, that was like a very sort of dystopian version of the future in some ways, you know, and, and um, so it was, it was a balance between those two. And then, and then, you know, uh, going to school in England, 
I went to girls' schools where where architecture didn't really exist. You know, it was it was either the arts or the sciences, and 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 I, I think I was. I you know I, it's such a ridiculous thing that you have to choose uh, so early. You know, mm. in in a way that's going to kind of fundamentally form the rest of your life. It seems mm-hmm. absurd. Um, but uh, I thought at that point that I should choose something that I sort of couldn't do on my own. I thought that I, you know, English and books I could somehow tackle by myself, but um, Mm. the sciences, you know, so I I chose I was going to do medicine. I got a place at medical school and almost instantly realized that 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 wasn't what I wanted to do. And it was partly because... um, you know, it became very clear almost instantly that uh, that you had to specialize, that you had to 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 narrow your field as you progressed through it, and that you um, had to keep discarding things that were were points of interest, and um, and so I think uh, you know. And I love you know, what really interested me. I think was was the brain and consciousness. I mean, partly my brother had a terrible brain accident when he was when he was young, and so was in intensive care for a long time. And, and there was something about that that realm of consciousness and the unknown and what was going on and how little people really knew about it. I mean, he's very well now, but. Um, it was very, very, uh, very much a part of our lives for a while. So that became very interesting. But in order to get to this sort of abstract realm within medicine, you had to go through this, this, this narrowing tunnel. And uh, um, and then I didn't know really what to do. I sort of stopped with that, and and I was living in New York for a while and doing illustration to make money. I, I had a lot of friends who were in art school who were much older than me and they, you know, through them I was able to get work doing illustration and it was very well paid and I could then go back and forth and pay for myself on planes and so on. Um, and it was fun, you know. New York then was great. Um, is, it not so much fun? is it not so much fun now? I find it very cleaned up. It feels very yeah. sanitized and... Um, and you know it's a bit like London. You know, the, New York it was a great city to be relatively poor in. You know, uh, London was was was. You know, you could actually, as a human, a normal human being, you could live in these cities. And now, you have to be a kind of, you know, oligarch or a tycoon or or live like a rat. That's the other option. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, there there was that too. Actually, there were there were the mole people living. You occasionally on the subway would catch glimpses of people down the subway tunnels. You know, there was a whole population of people living in the sort of the the, the tunnel tunnels that weren't being used. Mm. There's these flickering lights. Now, I think Reagan emptied, you know, the 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 sort of And 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 the mole man from there, tunnels. and 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 New York was 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 turned into a kind of large gated community for the uber rich, which it, which it is. Mm. I mean, it's sort of nice. It's nice if you want but, to go. But you you end up. So where did you train in architecture? So I then so then I came back and I thought, okay, well, you know, what's what's something else that that takes a very long time that can provide a kind of scaffolding to my life you know sort of structure um uh, that isn't medicine um and then i then then uh, an uncle of mine in new york was very um he worked a lot with architects although he wasn't one himself and uh so i started looking also max protech in new york had a gallery where he was showing um the then paper architects so it was sort of Aldo Rossi and Zaha, and a lot of the architect, the, the the Uber architects now who who weren't able to build at that point. So, um, and that was very much being presented as as a form of drawing. You know, that was being presented as 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 a kind of 
you know, the, the, the way in which these ideas were being represented was, was very interesting, very compelling. So I, I looked into architecture when I got back and I went to um, PCL. I wanted to be in London. I didn't want a, a sort of um, campus life, you know, I didn't really want to, to, to particularly go in that much. I just, <laughs> I wanted the scaffolding and, and the kind of structure. And of course you have to, to, to go through it all in order to get the, the qualifications. Um, and at that time it was very much, you know, sort of archigram led. So there was the AA Bartlett and, and PCL as it was then, Westminster now. And um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I got very excited by a subject that, you know, where nothing was irrelevant ultimately, that's what I loved. The fact that you could kind of draw in any subject legitimately and make it part of 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 a way of of looking at, at architecture and building and the way in which it was integrated in its context. So so that to me was 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 the most um and that I still love about architecture. I, I, I think it's it's completely magical from that perspective. Yeah, that's a really beautiful description. And you you evoke I don't know, there, there's something very evocative in the way you're speaking about this kind of rural life and then this hyper-metropolitan life. Yeah, it was very weird. And and you yeah, and you and your practice also sort of straddles the two realms. I mean, uh, the Flint House that I mentioned before is a rural project. Mm. But you also operate as urban architects as well. Mm with an interest in sort of the languages of modernity and the languages of the contemporary city and including leisure, pleasure, excitement, uh, anticipation and all of those things. Um, I was wondering about this. So, so after you qualified, how long was it, how long was it well after you, before you set up your practice? <laughs> it's quite funny. I mean, I sort of fell into it, I suppose. I mean, I, I was, um, it was quite a funny time. I was I, my partner at the time was was um, much older than me, uh, Malcolm McLaren, who um, was twenty years older, and very much in a sort of world of fashion and music and and so on. And um, so we were sort of living in Paris, and and I did my part to or whatever, you know, year out after the degree in Berlin, because there was no work in in London. And um and it was so again, this was after was this after Black Wednesday? Was this uh, because of the economic crises or was there yeah. just okay. No, when yes, I'm 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 terrible with sort of dates and timing, but something like that. Yeah. And and I remember going to to Berlin there was a lot of you know work going on there at the time and um i had been sharing a flat um at one point with jasper morrison you know who's a furniture designer and he he had been in berlin and introduced me to someone axel kufus who who was also a furniture designer but he was actually he was given his first architectural scale project, which was to reimagine um, an expressionist building that had been burnt down. And so um, he was living at the time in this, and living and working in this huge old munitions factory in the former East in, in Berlin. And um, and he was used to, you know, as, as, a, as a furniture designer to draw everything at the scale of, you know, one to one or one to ten maximum, you know, the, the, the sort of compression. And so we ended up, just the two of us working on this project, and I would draw these gigantic axonometrics, you know, that, that, <laughs> that sort of filled the floor of this munitions factory, one to five or one to one to two. Um, and it was just it was just a very magical way of 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 
somehow bridging you know study and the real world you know it was almost like the the, the kind of the map of the world at one to one you know okay. <laughs> reproduce this this crazy thing anyway so so from there i went back to london i i i finished my studies and um i i i was i the 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 second job i had in berlin was in a conventional practice and and i absolutely hated it it was it was a very kind of macho um practice I was the only woman there and I'd heard that there had been one other woman who who worked there at one point and she would go home every night in tears you know it was it was not fun and I hated it so much that I I thought I'll never you know I never want to work in a practice again and um I didn't I mean apart from my own um but it it put me off architecture quite seriously and so I I was working quite a lot with Malcolm at the time. We were working on film scripts. We were working, you know, in fashion. We were working in all sorts of areas. Um, and I was trying to find a way that somehow, you know, I wanted to do something that had some kind of meaning. It wasn't just designing um, a, a house for someone or, you know, whatever bathroom extensions or you know there, there 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 was a level of architecture that that I saw in that practice in Berlin that that I I knew that I didn't want to engage with and um so I did avoid it for a while I set up my own business actually um then I set up something called Ecolab which was looking it it was it's probably rather chaotic. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, none of these things seem to be presented in a linear way. But at the time, my mother was very ill with cancer. And I was uh, looking at the impact of food on health. And so the the business that I set up was using food as medicine. And it was looking at organic food and um, uh, but somehow using design to make it um, very seductive and compelling you know at that point it was much more hair shirts you know the world has vastly changed since then but it was also seeing how many people you could impact through design so you know in response to this feeling of sort of helplessness that I think a lot of people and a lot of students feel you know it's how do you how do you uh, find uh, how do you uh, work within the media that you, you know, are trained in or that you um, are able to express yourself through uh, in a way that can make a meaningful difference or impact. And so at that point, I saw the application of design to food and, and uh, environmental issues um, more relevant to 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 what I wanted to do so it's sort of eco lab became a sort of hold or for 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 any ideas related to to that how to how to address the environment through design and funnily enough that's remained quite consistent through a lot of the, the work that I've done since then but it's manifested in in different ways <clears throat> so um, anyway, I raised um, over a million pounds actually then and, and set up this business and, and was working and suddenly we were employing 60 people. It was rather, it was rather terrifying. Um, it was in the late 90s. This was in 99, 2000, yeah. Wild, um, wild times. <laughs> was, I mean, there were wild times coming off the back of the nineties. I think things seemed yeah. so possible. I know it was it was wild, and I was doing it with very interesting people, you know, in in food and and restaurants and fashion, and and it was very exciting. And um, anyway, ultimately, it didn't work out, and there was a sort of clash between investors, and I mean, it really 
endless board meetings and financial meetings were quite um, quite impressive. Um, so the business closed eventually, and I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, and then uh, Joe Corey and, and um, Serena Reese were starting Agent Provocateur at that time. And they loved Ecolab and the way it looked. And um, so they asked if I would design their shops for them. Um, and, you know, so it was very much doing pencil drawings in my flat to to get the first one off the ground. And um, what was the first one in New York? The first one we did um, was in the Royal Exchange in London, uh, and the second one was New York, and and it was suddenly in this very fast because you know you're dealing with the kind of fast turnaround of retail and fashion and. Um, and it was very exciting. You know, Damien Hurst was doing windows and Kate Moss was modeling. And, you know, it was funny and anarchic and and and, and, and mad, actually. Um, but, and we did over 50 of them. And it was, so it was sort of falling, you know, back into architecture, you know, through, uh, it, it, I didn't, I didn't choose to go back into it. It's sort of, you know, its tentacles got me, and um, never lets you go, does it? No, I know, and 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 actually, it was it was it it created this wonderful freedom because you know once we'd created this kind of bible of details and and there's a lot of freedom in in fashion, and uh, and then I you know had to employ people and I was working with uh, uh, Jaime de la Peña who I studied with and. And suddenly, you know, we seem to have this little practice. We set up a limited company. And um, and the wonderful thing about it was that it kind of gave us freedom to play, you know, with architecture. And um, so, you know, we, we were able to make films, design boats, you know, I mean, playing with materials, experimenting in, in, in ways that, that often practice doesn't allow, you know. Mm. Um, so it was it was a, a kind of cushion, if you like. Um, and um, and I think because, you know, I really didn't, I really hadn't worked within normal practices, um, I, I didn't have <laughs> all the, the normal means of approaching architecture through, you know. Jaime, Jaime had worked in... in in offices, so he knew a bit more about the whole way in which you're supposed to do things. But but I I didn't have a clue really. <laughs> I like the idea of moving seamlessly from appetites and maybe your next appetite. So you've got food to begin with, and then sex and the sex next. Set. What's <laughs> the ne what's the next one going to be? Uh, Kate and De La Pena going to be doing um violence <laughs> violence architect? No, it's good. <laughs> I did do well. I I taught um, for for a while. I, I taught at the Royal College of Art, and um, which I enjoyed a lot. I, I also taught in Germany, which was very different. But um, it was uh, the Royal College. Uh, you know, the, the, there was a sort of focus on narrative mm. in architecture, which I've always found very interesting. Mm. Uh, and again, this is how. There are so many overlaps with the different disciplines and how you can keep drawing on almost anything around you as a source mm -hmm. of inspiration. Um, but I remember, I mean, to go back to your thought of violence, you know, the, the uh, one year, you, you set themes mm -hmm. for, for each year for the, for the students. Um, and one year I, I looked at horror. Um, which I think actually is 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 fascinating because because in a way if you think you know most people if you if you even just say the word horror will will think of something something architectural will come to mind so uh, you know often quite gothic but then you know there there are there are all these different um, uh, permutations of horror and, and and very often they'll be uh, very personal to, to someone's experience 
Um, and the idea was not to produce a kind of, you know, uh, school of, of, of students <laughs> producing horrific architecture, but, but really to, to use horror as a way of um, becoming uh, aware of what it is that, that triggers reactions to it, you know, in in such a way. Mm. So, um, and also to look at the kind of ethics of architecture, you know, you also have, I was looking at the time um, at, uh, I was writing about architecture and, and the, the morality of architecture and, and the codes within architecture, which you might compare to a sort of, Hippocratic Oath in, in medicine, for instance. But if, as, as was, you know, the focus of what I was looking at at the time, um, in America you have architects designing prisons and, and, and rooms or buildings in which people are literally killed, um, then you have to question what those ethics and morals actually are. Do you, do you know, it, it, it becomes a, a very rich... Um, uh, area, I think. I mean, the American Institute of Architects did vote on whether or not architects should be designing these um, murderous <laughs> buildings, and and they voted pretty unanimously that they should. So, they but they were. shouldn't. That they should. That they would. <laughs> yeah, it's a big business. So there you go. Oh, it's a big business. I mean, I've been looking. I, uh, this is apropos of of of, o of only what you're talking about, and not what I had expected to talk to you about, but I've been thinking quite a lot about this. I mean, I'm very interested in this idea and your use of the word morality, which I think is fantastic. It's a, it's a, it's a strong word. It's a dynamic word, but I think it scares people because, and which is why they substitute it for the word ethics. Yes. Um, you know, to talk about ethicality is, is easier and it kind of associates you, I think, in, in a certain demographics mind with things like Amnesty International and Greenpeace and, um, XR, rather than morality, which associates you with kind of traditional structures of social organization like the church. Mm, mm. But there is, but it, but it comes back to this idea of professionalism, isn't it? Like as professional architects, there is an, a professional obligation to be good, like morally good. I mean, well, it's, it's that, funny. So you think of the sort of Vitruvian idea of what an architect should be or an architecture should do or deliver and and um it seems that that architects have, have strayed so far from that you know Why and, do you think actually, that is? What, what what do you think has caused I, I do think i do think the the money uh, yeah i think money is a big part of it i think that there's a the professional structure is is very alienating it's very it's a very convenient way to kind of distance yourself from from the core of, of of what you're actually doing, you know, you mm. you, you delegate responsibility to to um, institutions or 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 legal uh, implications. You know, I think um, obviously architecture's got incredibly litigious, and so you often feel that that people aren't really producing a, a building which has a, a sort of uh, honesty about it, but it's more like a kind of inhabitable spreadsheet or contract. You know, you, you're, 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 you're operating this, this dry, um, rather soulless um, envelope that contains the, 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 the means to avoid being arrested. <laughs> <laughs> Which is amazingly ironic because, because, of course, to go back to this issue of, of, of morality, it's precisely that approach to architecture which leads to, to Grenfell. Mm, and, 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 and not only, I mean, Grenfell is the, is the extraordinarily sad, tragic and, and terrible thing, but, but I live in Kent. Yeah. And we're, we're witnessing in Kent the absence of architecture. And it's really, so there's this other aspect to it, which is that architecture has absented itself from broader discussions around urban generation, urban growth, mm -hmm. urban change. Mm -hmm. So what you get is vast swathes of housing which you've never seen an architect because mm -hmm. we've decided mm -hmm. that that's below us. 
Mm, mm. Well, I, I mean, uh, Grenfell is, is one of the most horrific things and actually watching the way in which it was debated and the way people desperately tried to, you know, resist any kind of responsibility at every level. Didn't they blame the firemen in the end? Wasn't well, that? No, no, I mean, it was just, it's just, uh, it's really physically sickening to watch. Yeah. And, um, and I think housing is one of the noblest things that people could ever do, you know, I mean, yeah. Coming up with with um, really interesting, innovative ways of dealing with it. And in fact, I, I did write a, an essay for the Architectural Review about this, you know, and the role of the architect and what the role of the architect is and should be and has been in the past and could be perhaps in the future. Mm. And and I I did spend quite a bit of time looking at South America, right? Because I I, I think they're very many different interesting examples of, of um, it's almost like a kind of amplification of some of the problems that we have here, do you know, that, that have actually been going on for a long time um, in in South America. There were, I'm, I'm thinking, for instance, there was a there's a lot of social housing, there are a lot of housing schemes, and there are also the vastly growing slums and favelas, informal housing, however you want to describe it. And, and you know, you, I, I traveled there with um, a group called Urban Think Tank, who, who, were, um, who began in, in Caracas and Venezuela. And they were doing very interesting sort of experiments, you know, and and recording and and responding to some of the ways in which uh, the city had quite violently changed when it went from being a very prosperous, uh, you know, oil-based economy to 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 one that had completely crashed and failed. And they they were looking in particular at uh, the the Torre David, you know, which was the um, <clears throat> which was a, a building built by a banker that, that remained um, incomplete, um, that was then squatted in this very um, imaginative way, you know, mm. where, where a whole sort of uh, sort of urban structure grew up within this, this concrete frame, you know, which included people taking motorbikes up through the you know, the, the the bribing people up because the lifts were never installed. There were churches and barber shops and, and you know, it, it, it was an entire microcosm within this building. But there, 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 there are other examples. I mean, there was a scheme in Peru um, that was that was developed in, in the 1960s when the um, president was... Um, at that time was also an architect and he set up this extraordinary competition where he wanted to get the best architects in the world at that time uh you know which included <clears throat> sterling and and christopher alexander and the japanese metabolists and aldo van eyck and to bring them all together to compete to to come up with brilliant low-cost housing and he was supposed to choose one architect from from the competitors to to take forward, but thought so all the solutions were so good that he wanted to build them all. So he started building them all. He he built four hundred units, I think, before there was a political coup and he was thrown out. But I mean, there, there's a sort of it's fascinating when you look around the world. You look at Russia, you look at South America, you look at India, you look at Africa. These different solutions when 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 you know often the the circumstances are much more extreme um mm. but again architecture is this brilliant lens that you can use to view the world through mm. and, and yeah. understand. um you've mentioned and talked about housing a bit and you've used some lovely phrases seductive and compelling which i think is um a really good way of talking about the value of design um, as you were talking about it in relation to food, mm. health, and then obviously the rather easier sell, which is using it around ladies' underwear. Um, <laughs> it would have been terribly, wouldn't have been so difficult to make Agent Provocateur 
um, shots seductive and compelling. But but I'm I'm interested. So one of the one of the themes in your in your own design work as a practice has been around this word you use of geoarchaeology. Mm. And I think um, and for me that it's a really lovely link back to this description of your early years in Ireland and this kind of mm. bedding, this kind of very Irish sensibility, like the poetry of Ireland has a very earthy kind of feel to it. Mm. And and then there's this other thing which you talk about, you've talked about a lot. So this seduct seductiveness, but there's this other thing which you talk about, which is this idea of a narrative. And this geoarchaeology as an architectural device seems to fit within both that um, I, I suppose it's, uh, it's attachment to the landscape. And then this idea of telling a story through the landscape, telling a story through architecture um, and 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 it, using that in a way to imbue buildings with a kind of an agency or permitting the agency of architecture to be revealed. And I think something that my wife was talking to me about we, we're watching a program called the only murders in the building <laughs> it's it's steve martin and uh it's on uh, one of the the it's on netflix and um it's about a podcast yeah. um, and it's about steve martin and this other actor and this girl in the building and various other people coming in and they're making a podcast about someone dying in the building but the building is an actor in the in the show that's undoubtable and the city is another actor in the show it's set in new york and it's very funny i mean steve martin's very funny man but and um and uh, that that i feel without even thinking about it you've been talking about this idea of the moral quality of architecture is to imbue or permit architecture to have a name and um an agency to be an actor in that drama Mm. Um, maybe you could talk about geomorphology, uh, geoarchaeology, sorry, uh, a, a wee bit. And and you've mentioned so many different things. All of I'm sorry. They're all things that completely. I'm going to try to answer one by one. Um, the geo geoarchaeology. You're absolutely right. I think it began in 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 the mud in Ireland. Um, you know, and I, I think that's completely, uh, you know, the way you, you really, are, maybe it's that you're a different height or something, but somehow the earth is that much closer. And, and, and I do have these sort of insane sea cravings for the Atlantic, you know, I was on either side of it for a long time. And Madrid, uh, sadly, is as far from the sea as you can be, but um, so this idea of ge geoarchaeology, it's the combination of a physical landscape and, and um, you know, the, the, the rocks of which it's formed, literally, um, but also the, 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 the human occupation of it. So what's happened there and, and what, you know, interaction there's been between, you know, the, the, the landscape and the occupation of it. And I think... Um, uh, I mean, it's true, the Flint House is possibly the most literal sort of expression of that in the sense that, I mean, it was a very funny thing, you know, to go to your 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 murders and your clues. When you first visit a landscape, you're, you're sort of looking for, for something, some sort of lead to follow, something that will trigger a response, you know, something. And, and a lot of that's just very intuitive, you know. That, that, so I think you go uh, back and forth between a, a kind of uh, rational or rigorous exploration of the place or, or its history and its, 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 its location in the world. Um, and and the purely intuitive, you know, and, and the, you know, the way in which you, you respond to that. And um, so in the case of, of the Flint House, it was, you know, I went to see the site in, in winter. And it's um, at the lowest point of that whole estate in Buckinghamshire. Um, and 
it was really bleak, I have to say. The, the, there were no leaves on the trees, all the water sort of naturally, you know, sinks to that point. And the field next to the site had been plowed. And in order to sort of get some distance to look at the site, I had to walk into the field and 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 the earth is made up very much clay. So um, you know what it's like when you, you know, I was wearing boots and and I walked through the clay and soon, you know, I had these sort of balls of mud attached to my shoes that were the size of, you know, small boulders. And um, so I was sort of stuck in the middle of this field, not really able to move, you know, in, but it was fascinating because as I say, the, the, the lines of the, the field were plowed, you know, perpendicular to the site, which is a very long, narrow one. And so they looked like, it was like being trapped in a kefir painting, you know, with this very rough clods of earth. But because they had been ploughed, there were all these sort of flints that had field flints that had been sort of thrown up in the furrows and this thing. And I've always loved kefir paintings and the kind of rawness of, of, of that. And the way that the, 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 you know, the way that these lines of perspective were creating a kind of vanishing point at the center of the site seemed completely compelling. And, um, and then, um, you know, I didn't really, you know, I, I, I always loved Flint, but I didn't really know so much about it. And, and so I started reading about flints and the fact that they only appear in chalk and that there's this chalk fault line that runs from Norfolk through Oxfordshire down to the south coast where it sort of emerges as the white cliffs of Dover. And it goes through all these incredible, um, you know, uh, formations along that route. So there are Grimes graves, these Neolithic, uh, <clears throat> these Neolithic flint mines um, in Norfolk. And then, you know, there, there are, there, there, it's just a completely fascinating narrative curve, if you like, that ends in the needles and the sea. And all the flint architecture in England is along that line. And it varies completely, you know, from culture to culture and through different periods. But, but um, you know, and then I looked at the geology of that particular place of Aylesbury, and, and it really is this, it really does look like a building, actually. Um, it's this sort of striated, um, and it's represented in geological drawings, you know, as dark lines with pale chalk and and so the idea of sort of extruding this thing literally from the landscape where you sort of pull the geography out the geology out to make it visible became very compelling you know uh, mm -hmm. and, and it and it did still sit within the the landscape and the trees um that in a way that that, that continued that sort of kefa as vanishing point so yeah that was quite literal um, but there are different ways in which we've interpreted i mean there was another project that we did for an art institute in saudi which was very much um using a, a limestone landscape for instance you know and and by you know the site was again on a sort of fault line of, of, of this very beautiful sort of lime and sandstone and um, and the whole exercise became, you know, how something could be embedded in that landscape and how all the different forms of the same stone could be used. You know, some of the rock is very friable and fragile and, and easily broken. And as you go deeper into the rock face, it becomes more stable and, and sounder. <clears throat> and so we were, we were trying to work with that very extreme climate. Um, and the, the site itself to, to create uh, a very varied uh, architecture. And then looking at the sort of the architecture of the Nabataeans, you know, where you, you know, like Petra in the, in the north of Saudi, there are these unbelievable rock cut tombs. And, and they're doing exactly that. You know, so so working with Bureau Happold and, and looking at the 
geology of that rock. You then look at the first century AD and see precisely that they're cutting back the surface of the friable, you know, fragile rock face to get to the stable stone to 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 it to create an architecture. Mm. And so that is 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 a sort of wonderful, you know, example of this sort of geoarchaeology where you've got two things that 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 you know where where one becomes the expression of the other. Mm. The um so it's a very sorry. Sorry, no, the 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 these huge thunderstorms in Madrid. Oh, are they coming back? <laughs> uh no, I I do like this idea of the of this word geoarchaeology and and clearly in Flint House and the way you've described it in this work in Saudi as well. It's about sort of not just uncovering and then kind of re-embodying nature in a kind of pastiche or postmodern way, but it's about explore, as I understand, about exploring and understanding the intimate reciprocity of co-creation between nature and human cultural action, human building action, Absolutely. and looking at so so the the flint, and flint is an interesting build, building material because it's not very stackable. No. <laughs> Because it's all weird shapes, and and it's stuck in chalk. And I, I, we, I was talking with my children the other day about that. Like, how the hell does it get into the chalk? We don't understand. We we leave large quantities of science just over there as mystery. Well, no, it, it, it's fascinating. It's 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 the rising and falling of the the sea. So you you end up with with uh, deposits of organic matter. That, that then, as the sea returns, you, you get covered with the exoskeletons of all these little marine creatures, and you get this sort of stacking, and it represents the, the, the sort of ebb and flow of, of, of the sea. Mm -hmm. This this wonderful, because it does have this very strange quality, you know, that that's, mm -hmm. that's, it's not earth, you know, in the conventional sense. It hasn't been digested in that way. It's this very it's a very marine like thing and those bone like shapes and the funny thing is you know i mean having an idea and then trying to get from the idea to a built reality is quite tricky and i think you know this partly goes back to the fact that i didn't really work in an office and didn't know what i was doing <laughs> you know because i think that if i had had more knowledge or experience I probably wouldn't have done some of the things I've done but then you get you know caught in your own trajectory and, and you have to kind of see these things through and it's very exciting when they work um, but you know it was trying to find given that you know Flint work really hasn't been done for, for a couple of hundred years you know most of the work that's done in it or had been until then was repairing existing buildings. So trying to find people who could not only could do that work, but were interested in in, in doing something that that sort of hadn't been done with that material before was very challenging. And, mm. and at that time, um, the flints were, were were treated as a waste material. Mm. So it's a waste material for for for. For, for the excavation of chalk for, for agriculture or building, you know, cement and so on. Um, they don't use, now, it, don't use it in pottery making anymore, of course, either, as the potteries have closed, because they used yeah. to fire it, didn't they, and, and use it in for yeah. glaze. Yeah, absolutely, mm. yeah. But that's changed, and now Flint is, is apparently, according to the Flint man, the, the amazing man who did do the work, um, it's it's had a sort of revival, which is. Mm. Really but your work seems to sit. That work seems to sit, and and other work that you have done seems to have some kind of association with the ideas of the vernacular. And I suppose that comes back to the lovely tension you talk about. At, you talked about at the beginning of going back to the sort of, in a way, very rudimentary and primitive monolithic forms and utilizing materials that illustrate, exemplify that most clearly. But mm. at the same time, your work is a 
robustly modern and contemporary, mm. um, which I find really, really interesting. I mean, have you consciously pursued ideas derived from the vernacular, or do, or or and and if so, like what is this an aesthetic kind of choice, or it, does it come back also to that idea of this is a better way of doing things compared with the kind of thin, glazed, stickish, mm. mm. and unsustainable kind of architecture that 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 you probably encountered in practice in the eighties and nineties. Mm. Yeah, that, that, there's something very alien and very um, kind of unappealing about uh, architecture that feels so kind of patently dishonest. Do you know, there is something that I've I I, I find quite repellent about that mm. um, and um, but it's funny you know we're working on this project um, at the moment in um, <clears throat> in Finland just below the edge of the Arctic Circle um, and oh. it's it's um, it's it's a project that came out of lockdown um, in the sense that um, you know, I was in Seville with um, with my husband, who who runs an extraordinary sort of workshop in Madrid um, called Factum Arte. It it makes artworks, but it 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 also um, there's a foundation that records cultural heritage, mm-hmm. and um, and we were. We were in Seville and, and the temperature had reached nearly 50 degrees. And um, and it was, I mean, it was unbearable. You know, as, I, as you know, it's sort of Ireland, the cold Atlantic is, is for me. And, and, and so I was sort of stuck in this hotel looking on the internet and came across this Instagram post on the Brutalism Appreciation Society. Um, about um, about an Alva Alto's first industrial building that was for auction, apparently, and um, and so I, you know, I googled around trying to find what this might be, and and eventually, I mean, there was sort of New York auction houses selling off door handles for eighty thousand dollars or something, and, and you know, or a stool. But finally, I found this weird little website. It was an auction site from the north of Finland. It was selling things like, um, you know, chains for car tires and and fishing tackle and you know outboard motors and skis and and sort of. Thing. And then among all of this was Alva Alto's first industrial building. It, it, you know, had this sort of suggested price of 6,000 euros and and <laughs> this sort of dream of, of the Arctic. Um, you know, we, we, uh, um, we uh, um, put in a bid, you had to bid in, in increments of 250 euros. So we put 250 euros in and ended up with this building, you know, um, which what, is and now, on a site or in package. No, 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 no. It's it's a twenty eight meter tall concrete silo, <laughs> and and you know, and it was a completely sort of mad thing that we never expected to to happen. Mm-hmm. And then the the question was, you know, what what the hell do we do with this building on the edge of the Arctic Circle? And, and I mean, I've always loved Alto's work, and this is a fascinating building. It's like a kind of expressionist cathedral. It's it's quite a radical, concrete building. Is it visible uh, online? Can people see it? Yeah, yeah. No, we've, we're, we're, we've set up now this whole project around it. It's called the Alto Silo. And... Um, I mean, I, I guess um, um, this is this is a building that we're sort of using as a critique of itself. Can you see it? <laughs> it's fantastic. It genuinely looks like a Rachel Whiteread cast, casting of the interior of a 
uh, an early 20th century Catholic church. It's true. You're absolutely right. That's a great way of putting it. Well, Alto was completely obsessed with film. Um, and he was in this rather subversive film club in the 20s and watched a lot of sort of Russian and German expressionism. And, and, and I don't know whether that influenced him, but but what's really what what fascinated me about the project was was do you know how at the beginning of modernism so many architects were completely obsessed with silos as building forms you know these these completely impenetrable concrete structures that had no decoration and I mean Gropius wrote about them in in nineteen twelve or something. Um, Corbusier wrote about them, Bruno Taut, Mendelssohn. Eric Mendelssohn was the only one who actually went to Buffalo to go and see the huge grain silos. Rayno Bannon wrote about them later. But they were all they were all obsessed with these as, you know, being the radical break with the, the past. And um, and what sort of fascinated me was was the way that these buildings could only really um emerge in parallel with technology. So that these tall grain silos could only take the forms they took with the development of the bucket lift that was invented by this guy who lived in Buffalo, New York. And that carried the, the, the grain from the boats into the tops of these things. But it was also the beginning of, of capitalism as we know it. You know, it was the beginning of the futures market where you could sort of hold grain and release it to control the market. And, you know, so it was just this fascinating turning point in, 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 in architecture, actually, um, you know, where resources were infinite, you just took and used and, 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 um, and, and, you know, the, the, the whole world was structured around that mentality at that time, with no thought of, you know, what consequences there might be for the environment or the land. And so, um, so anyway, this project has now become sort of uh, a critique of that, if you like. So we're, we're, this is the, the, the geoarchaeology where we're looking at you know we're looking at the history of Finland and 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 capitalism and the environment through this silo building. So if you if you think um Finland's only been independent since 1917 and when it became independent it was apparently as as poor a country as Namibia. And the only resource they have are trees and timber. So everything is, you know, generated from that. And they, you know, the money that was generated through that then went into education and it's created, you know, modern Finland. But it was so interesting to look at this, this city, which I knew nothing about, Olu, just under the Arctic Circle, where... They used trees to create pine tar that was used by the British boats in the 17th century, you know, to waterproof them. The British boats then, you know, conquered the colonies and so on. And then to 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 the this building was commissioned also by an Englishman um, uh, for cellulose pulp to for newspaper print in the UK. And you sort of think, my God, all of these things, you can sort of read the history of the 20th century through a single building. Mm. And what we're doing with it is, is we're restoring that building, which is very radical. It's, you know, 100 mil thick concrete, 28 meters high, just sort of head, held rigid by these fins. And um, not, not, fi not finished people, just a. Just... <laughs> Both, I guess. <laughs> And we're building a new research center next to it now. So using that to develop a protocol for cutting up concrete, waste concrete, so sort of concrete spolia, um, to, to, to form new buildings. <laughs>
So that that that's that's quite an interesting. I mean, if you look again, I mean, you can look at ancient buildings where classical temples were sort of cut up and stacked, you know, into completely different forms, mm. and you end up with this mad, you know, aesthetic, um, which I love. But this sort of spolia stacked. Mm -hmm. And I think to do that with concrete, you know, which is probably the most destructive, you know, material within construction, is 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 quite an interesting challenge. Yeah, wonderful. Very, very beautiful. Um, I I don't want to take more of your much more of your time. I mean I do, but I shouldn't. Um I just wondered, you've mentioned uh sort of issues around practice that you've you, you yourself has experienced you know both as a female earlier on earlier on in your career but just this kind of strange ambivalence towards i suppose towards reality towards conditions as we find them that that normative practice and perhaps our professional bodies have been guilty of um not challenging or inculcating or sort of various things and i wondered whether you 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 would you think that the way that you practice and your practice works is a is a preferable model insofar as it is slower it probably um uh it's more thoughtful it's um reflective and so on and that and, and whether i suppose that the, the way that you practice has scalability within it such that it's capable of addressing some of the kind of challenges which are very very large particularly around urbanization and, and and things like that, or whether this is a kind of practice model that is attuned to a certain kind of type of work, certain type of client, certain type of context. Um, good question. Um, Which you don't have to answer. You can just tell me. No, I, I think it's really interesting. And I think it goes back to what I uh, mentioned at the you know earlier, when I said, you know, architecture is very difficult because um, the question that, that mattered to me at least was, was how do you make um, the work that's done meaningful, do you know, mm. within, within that medium? And, um, you know, it, it may be that you just design small things over a long period of time that, that may or may not be beautiful. Um, but I think it, in a way it's more interesting to go beyond that. And I suppose um, what we're doing in in um, Olu with this, the Alto Silo is, is an example of that where we're trying to develop a protocol for uh, the reuse of demolition concrete, um, <clears throat> which is a real problem of vast scale, um, where we're also, and, and because Olu is the sort of scale that it is, you know, it's, it, Finland's a small country, and this is its second city, if you like, um, it, it means that, that we can work directly with the city to try and develop that protocol in a very active way. Mm. Um, Olu is going to be the European City of Culture 2026. And what we're trying to do as well as develop an aesthetic and, and a methodology for cutting up existing concrete structures that are being demolished for whatever legitimate reason. Um, it's also how to work out the economics of that. So um, you, you know, we're, there's a sort of conundrum when you're doing a project like this, which is who pays for the demolition? You know, is it the person who's demolishing the building? It's obviously a slightly more complex process. You know, we have to work with engineers to to sort of over engineer, if you like, the pieces that we're going to rebuild with, because they're going to behave in a very different way to to concrete that's newly poured and and with fresh rebars. Um, but there's also just the economics of it, where you think, you know, we've got to water jet cut on site these pieces; they've got to be disassembled and transported. 
um, you know, normally someone who's demolishing a building has to pay for that demolition. How do the, how does that work? So so what we're what we're trying to do is to develop a, a, a structural, economic, and aesthetic protocol for that process of of reusing um, <clears throat> concrete. Um, so I think that's an example um, where the relevance goes beyond the the the, the single you know, example or single mm -hmm. instance. And and what's fascinating about this this place is that it's it's a neglected uh sort of suburb of the city which has become a a, a place for refugees. So in an unlikely way there are over a hundred different nationalities and we're seeing how we can use these interventions to make a sort of radical regeneration of that part of the city. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're also introducing technologies. I mean, it turns out that Nokia were based in 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 Olu, so it's this very radical sort of tech center, and and all of these things become um, part of a, a of a um, you know a, a way of having a bigger impact. The research that will happen in this center is looking at water levels and and how um <clears throat> climate change is affecting the environment in 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 finland in olu the the land is rising one centimeter a, a, a year it's 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 quite radical the same rate that venice is sinking so it's it's because glaciers are melting and the land is bouncing back so you, we're setting up a series of monitors along that Bothnian Bay that are going to be recorded there and compared with other parts of the world. So it becomes a sort of monitoring center. So it, it, it takes something that's very small, like a, an abandoned silo building and turns it into something that's potentially global. Mm. That's wonderful. I think that's a really wonderful point to finish on and I'm very grateful for your time Charlotte thank you no it's a real pleasure thank you so much for inviting great stimulating talk now we know thanks to Charlotte for permitting me to persist and for engaging with such elegance in this discussion as before see the podcast description for links to Skeen Caitling de la Pena's online presence Charlotte's written stuff and news of the silo of course it's all very good thanks for listening